all engineering surfaces have irregularities as we zoom into them. These irregularities are called as asperities and they range at different scales. They also give rise to the surface roughness. When two surfaces slide over each other, these asperities interact with each other. In this process, they deform and attract or repel each other and altogether result in what is known as frictional force, which is resistance to the sliding. There are several factors that affect the frictional behavior between two surfaces. A few of them include the surface finish, the material properties of surfaces, the chemical properties of the surfaces, and even the load and boundary conditions that they are subjected to. In terms of contact forces, the frictional forces are nothing but the tangential force component. While the normal force is trying to prevent penetration, the tangential component is resisting the relative sliding between the two surfaces. Friction is a very complex phenomenon and capturing a fully detailed response is an uphill task. But holistically, it can be described using a simple model called as Coulomb friction model. This model states that the body starts sliding only when the applied force is more than or equal to the product of normal force times the coefficient of friction. When the applied force is less than this product, it remains in a static state and this is called as sticking state. When the applied force is ramped up beyond the product, the body starts sliding and this state is called as the slipping state. Now let's focus on this term which is the coefficient of friction. This is a single property that encapsulates all the factors that we mentioned earlier in modeling the frictional behavior between two surfaces. So this quantity is specific to a pair of surfaces and it depends on surface roughness, material properties, adhesion, etc. between the pair of surfaces. In the simplest form, a constant value of coefficient of friction is used to model the frictional behavior. But when a body transitions from a stick to slip state, its coefficient of friction may change as a function of the sliding velocity and it's given by this equation. Over here, mu d is the coefficient of friction in slipping state and it's called as the dynamic coefficient of friction and mu s is a sticking state and called as the static coefficient of friction. V is the relative velocity between the surfaces and called as the sliding velocity. Notice that we only take the absolute value of the velocity as the transition of coefficient of friction only depends on the magnitude of velocity. And finally, C is a decay constant that controls the rate at which the static coefficient of friction transitions into the dynamic coefficient of friction. All these parameters are calculated via physical experiments and they are specific to the pair of surfaces. But is it always mandatory to use this level of detail in capturing the frictional behavior? The answer to this question depends on the pair of surfaces. In some systems, the difference between the static and the dynamic coefficient of frictions may be negligible and in such cases, we may ignore the transition and use a constant coefficient of friction. But in some systems, the difference may be too high to ignore and in such cases, it's important that we use this more detailed transition from static to dynamic coefficient. Here's a table of such values for a few common systems. We can see how in some cases, the difference is pretty big, while in others, the difference is virtually zero. Note that all these values are just estimates and may vary depending on the application and loading conditions of the system. We mentioned earlier that the frictional behavior is strongly influenced by the texture of rough surfaces. 
So, if there is an oriented texture on a surface, which is quite common, this introduces directional behavior of friction, which is also called as an isotropic friction. For instance, in this case, we are looking at the surface of an aluminum sample that was extruded in one direction. As a result, the surface has a texture along the direction of extrusion and the surface profiles look very different in the perpendicular directions. As a result, a body sliding in X direction experiences different frictional force compared to a body sliding in the Y direction. This is called an isotropic friction and in this case, the Coulomb friction model can be modified to have different coefficient of friction in two directions. So far, we discussed how friction is a retarding force, which means that it resists motion. This is done by dissipating the energy of the system as heat energy. So, when a system has friction, it's no longer energy conserved, and this makes it path dependent. To explain the meaning of path dependence, let's look at this block that moves from position 1 to position 2. In its journey, it can take multiple paths, but let's concentrate on these three paths. Path 1 is the shortest path and path 3 is the longest path between these three paths. So the system loses smallest amount of energy in path 1 and most energy is lost in path 3. In other words, the behavior of the system changes depending on the path taken by it between the starting and end points, which are the same in all three paths. This is nothing but path dependency. Due to this path dependency, it's important to follow the correct sequence or path during an assembly process. With the insight we have gained into frictional behavior, let's investigate why do we need to include friction in our calculations? It turns out that friction is the driving physics and many applications without which their behavior changes completely. For instance, in a belt drive, the power is transmitted from one shaft to another due to the friction between the belt and the shaft. In the absence of friction, the shaft would simply slip over the belt without transferring any power. Similarly, when a bunch of wood logs are piled over each other, they hold in place because the frictional force between them can balance the gravitational pull and maintain a static state. If the frictional force is not accounted for, then there are no forces to balance the gravity and the wood logs would simply slide away and turn into a transient case. As one final topic, let's look at the limiting friction. When the applied force is less than the frictional force, the bodies do not slide over each other. Sometimes, when the applied force is very high and yet smaller than the frictional force, the surface tears at the microscopic level and results in gross sliding. This is commonly seen in applications where the normal pressure is very high, such as surface grinding or when surfaces wear during operation. This is because when the friction force is limiting any sliding, the shear stresses at the surface increase and when they exceed the material failure limits, it fails and allows for gross sliding. This limiting friction force is dependent on the properties of the softer material between the two mating surfaces. In case of metals, this limiting shear stress is defined as a function of the yield strength. If there are two different metals in contact, say steel and aluminum, then the limiting shear stress is calculated based on the yield strength of the softer material, which is aluminum. In case of other materials such as elastomers, this limiting force is calculated based on the failure properties of those materials.
a reasonable estimate of this value should be calculated from physical experiments.